Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be talking about our micro projects. Now, first, just to check to see everybody can hear me or Jeff can hear me. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so we have a number of ways to volunteer with um, Data for Good Calgary. We have a big chapter and we have had a lot of interest in volunteering. And one thing that we were disappointed about was that we didn't have enough ways for people to volunteer. So we came up with a good way to get more people volunteering. And that is what we call the micro projects. And the micro projects are short-term projects. So the idea is that's a small project done by like one to five people. It's for social benefit or the public good. And it's time boxed. It's just one to four weeks. And the person that pitches an idea decides, is this like a really small thing? Is it a four week thing? But we like cut it off at four weeks. So if you have a big vision, cut it up into small pieces and you can do a lot of small pieces. But the idea is that you decide to do something, you do it, you say what you did and the community gets stronger through doing that. One thing we encourage is open data. So whatever data you've been using, other people can use for their projects. And tools is whatever you like to use. Finally, what makes this unique is that it's supported by Data for Good, both the core team in general and with project coordinators in specific. And I'll get into that in a moment. The reason we create micro projects was to give people an opportunity to volunteer that has a lot of benefits. First of all, when you volunteer for one of these small micro projects, it gives you a chance to use your skills and hone your skills in the benefit of social good. And it gives you a chance to learn new skills when you're working aside other people either learn new things about tools you already use or just learn a new tool entirely. It could be technical skills like Power BI or it could be soft skills like project management. You get a chance to collaborate with other data for gooders and also to network. And building your network is a great way to build what you know and to hear about opportunities in the city through who you know. So that's always good. The work you do could contribute to building a portfolio if you're ever out job hunting or otherwise want to show the work you've done. And the work you do grows data for goods, base of da uh, shared data, open data that can be used, and the knowledge of things you can do to support social good in Calgary. On top of that, things you do could benefit the community at large. It could be a website of affordable housing or a website about air quality or a visualization of all things that could be used by people outside of Data for Good that makes their lives a little easier. And finally, we hope that in doing this, you will have fun. So what could be a good micro project? If you were thinking, I would like to pitch an idea, I'd like to spend a week or a month doing something cool by myself or with a few other people in Data for Good, what would be a good project? Basically, anything that does good. So it could serve the community, it's socially responsible, and it's positive. On the other hand, we're not looking for things that uh, could be done by commercial organizations or things that or have a commercial or profit motive. And we're not looking for divisive things. So if you want to do something, for example, political, um, talk to us about it because we want to build things that bring people together. So if you pick a political project, we want it to be something that's positive and not going to split people apart. So in the end, the project selection is at the discretion of the data for good core team. And you'll see in a moment that the first thing you do is when you come up with an idea, you bring it to us and we'll let you know if it looks good and help you move it forward. Now, Jeff, if there's any questions in the chat, could you pass them on to me? Okay, thanks.
And I apologize for these pictures, maybe. Okay, there we go. So I'll go through the process briefly and then I'll dive into detail on a few of these items. But the process is pretty straightforward and starts with dreaming up an idea. So if you're going to be a project initiator, and I hope you all choose to be a project initiator at some point, think about what you'd like to pitch and then build it into something that happens. Your first step is to build an idea. And once you have an, a good idea that supports data for goods purpose, uh, you can fill out the project request form, which I'll show you shortly and submit it for review by data for good it gets reviewed by data for good and we'll let you know if it looks perfect or if there's anything we'd recommend changing so it might be some back and forth but in the end once you get the go decision then we will assign for you a project coordinator and the project coordinator is like the liaison with data for good who will help you through the stages of your project and answer any questions you have. Once the project is approved, it goes live. And first of all, we keep track of your projects because we're looking forward to building a database of projects that have been done and learnings and data sets so other people can build on this. And we will advertise on uh, social channels to let people know what projects are happening and what kind of help they're looking for. So if you have an idea for a project, but you need somebody to clean the data, or you'd like somebody that knows Power BI, or you'd like somebody that can scrape a website or visual things, visualize things geographically, all of those things you can put into a request for volunteers. And if we approve your project, we will pitch your project, we'll pitch the, your skill sets you're looking for. And then as people apply to work on your project, we'll give you a list of the people who are interested so you can build your team for this one to four week project. Once you've built the team, you start the project. And this is where the clock really uh, starts for the one to four weeks. The one to four weeks is for the work itself when you have the whole team assembled. You start with a kickoff. The project coordinator will be right beside you to help you with that. And the whole team will be there. And that's where you review your goals, scope, timing, expectations. We're gonna use Zoom or we're gonna meet at the library, all sorts of, all those details you start working. There will be at least one checkpoint, maybe a weekly checkpoint as you're going on to see how you guys are doing. Are you on track? And at the end of the project, we'll see, did the work finish? And did you meet your goals? And you shouldn't panic if you did not meet your goals. If you did not meet your goals, it's a learning. Uh, it's not terrible at all it just means you tell us what you did accomplish you record what you did accomplish and there's an opportunity perhaps to kick off another project to finish it because sometimes projects are bigger than you think when you start one thing that uh we want to emphasize with the these micro projects is you work for one to four weeks but when you're done we really want you to summarize what you did. Give us any links to, like maybe you did a visualization or a Twitter feed or just one really nice JPEG that summarizes information. Maybe you have a clean data set or a paragraph that really describes the problem that you think needs to be investigated. Whatever your output is, we'd like a link to that so we can share that with other people and other people have the opportunity to build on that. We also want you to record the data sets you used with attribution of where you got it and who gets credit for the original data set because that gives credit where credit is due and it gives us an opportunity to now reuse that data set. And that's going to be super valuable in future projects and future datathons 
if people find out what kind of open data is out there and start working with it and learn how to work with it. It is going to be great for your personal life and for any volunteer work you do for us with partner projects or with datathons. It's really going to help. Finally, we would love for you guys to just take five minutes at a meeting like this and talk about what you did, what you what your plan was, what you did, what happened. And maybe this worked great, or there may be learnings. There might be both. But sharing in this community is a way of getting to know each other better and learning from each other. Finally, at the end of it all, our project coordinator will record in our micro project database what happened. And that will be a chance to record these learnings for the future. So that is a high level look at the process. So Corinne, there's there's a couple of questions we should oh, probably sure. just, just answer yeah. now. So yeah, um, please. we will put the link into the chat for the project ideas that you have. Yeah. Uh, so that will go mm -hmm. into um, into the into the uh, into the chat. Idea. There is another question um, around uh, how often do we do these? Um, so this is you know, the third cohort. So we started kind of last year, and this is the the third cohort, and we're kind of learning as we're going and kind of ramping up. So um, you know, I think we'll ultimately get to maybe uh, you know four four of these uh, four of these a year. Um, but you know, I think uh, this year, the next year we might be not quite at four, but We'll probably, you know, at least have two more. So they they come up, you know, uh, fairly often. But they you know, it, it takes time to spin them up, uh, get them done, and then kind of uh, get them reported on as well. Um, so the way the cohorts work is, you know, we'll get we'll get your ideas, um, and you know, we may have who knows. Um, five to ten idea project ideas that get pitched. Uh, we we. Just based on our capacity, we'll we'll ch probably choose three or four uh, to do in this cohort, and then you know the other ones can certainly be carried over to the next uh, uh, to the next cohort uh, as well. So that's kind of how it works. So uh, you know if you uh, and for this for this cohort, we know that we're coming up against the uh, the Christmas holidays. So as, as the ideas sort of get accepted and the teams get formed, uh, each team can you know, decide when you want to start. Uh, if you want to start and work over the holidays, that's your choice. If you want to wait and start in January, that's totally acceptable as well, right? And uh, you know, the four weeks is a guideline, right? We're, that we, we don't want to go uh, too much over that. Um, but it's not something like we don't shut it down on, you know, when the clock ticks after four weeks exactly. So there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of flexibility in that. But, you know, it, it, as Corrine said, I mean, if it's, if it's a bigger project, and, and that's, that's great, uh, we would break it into multiple stages, right? Because we do want to have a very iterative type of process where we're completing, uh, completing tasks uh, and then launching, uh, launching new ones. And we have thought that if you have an idea, you don't have to wait until we have one of these cohorts. You can just send it in so that we have a record of it. And then we'll see if we have the capacity, but at least then it is on record as this is interesting and we can get back to you about when we may be able to consider it. Uh, so that link is live at all times, but these meetings like the one tonight is to help people get together to brainstorm and to yeah see what comes out of it so your your presentation is in full screen uh at the yeah moment. i had to come out of full screen to i link. did yeah. po post okay. the link in the chat no problem just wanted to make sure you knew thank i appreciate that 
So we are building, when I said we have a micro, micro project database, right now it's conceptual and we'll be building it in the new year. And right, I hate to say it, but right now we're managing things in Excel, which is a fine short-term solution because we don't want to lose the work we're doing. And it is also through these first few cohorts that we also find, learn more about the data we want to collect. So you guys are helping us build the concept and test the concept and make this concept successful. And if you want to help us build that micro project database, just uh, <laughs> put, put that in your, uh, your put that in your expression of interest form, which we'll start. We'll talk about a bit later. Good one, Jeff. Yeah, very well timed. Yeah. So when you pitch the project. We'll ask for things like a project title, year name, and email. If you have team members in mind, you're welcome to just propose them right away because you get to pick your team. So give us the name of anybody you know. And mention whether they would like to be acknowledged publicly for working on this project or if they'd like to be private because we give have that flexibility. Right. So, like, so, like for, so for you know tonight for example for example if you go to one of the breakout uh, breakout uh, zoom rooms and uh, have a great idea and you have you know uh, people there at, at in your room then that might be your team right there right so make sure you capture people's mm -hmm. interest and their names and their emails so that you can fill out that form and try to submit it as soon as possible like tonight would be best uh, to, to get that form in uh, so that, um, yeah, we can have them uh, sooner than later. When you send in the form, and good point, Jeff, to catch names of people that you're uh, getting, well, getting along with tonight when you're talking about ideas, catch their email so you can talk, also talk with them afterwards and make sure they're interested or, but you don't want to say, oh, I really enjoy talking with somebody, but I wish I knew who they were. Uh, project description, just a short description of your project and the goals, because we'd like you to have a tangible goal, even if it is just to describe the problem or find a data source, just have a goal that you can work towards. What's the social benefit? How much time will it take when you start the project? And like just said, we're not going to be a hard nosed about four weeks. But we're trying to make this small so that people can say, yes, I'll volunteer, and they know it's time boxed. They know they're free for four weeks, and they don't have to overcommit. That's a, a largely where that recommendation comes from. And then you're welcome to stack a number of projects one after the other to make a bigger good. And then you may choose different volunteers based on where you are in the project and what skills you need. And to that point, you can specify any skill sets you're looking for, whether it's a soft skill, like, um, I don't know, project management's the obvious one, but also time management or communication, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be just data skills like data cleansing or technical skills like Tableau and how many volunteers you'd like to have on the project. As I mentioned, we are considering privacy. So um, when you pitch a project or before it launches, you'll let us know which participants don't mind or would appreciate the names shared publicly if we ever post to Twitter or LinkedIn or Slack. If they don't want their names shared, their names and emails will be private, but note that anybody that's volunteering for a project, their names will be visible and their emails will be visible to anybody for any project they apply to. The project manager would see that, or the project lead, I should say. And the Data for Good core team would see their name and email. And if you get into a project, of course, anybody on the project will see your email and your name. But beyond that, you could keep it locked down if privacy is important. If not, 
then you will share your name more broadly, but your email will not be shared unless you choose through LinkedIn or whatever to share it. And that's then your choice. For the team formation, it's the person who has the idea that gets to assemble the team. And we will support that. We will advertise your project, we'll advertise the skill sets you want, and then we will tell you who has responded and what their responses were. Then you as the project initiator, you get to choose your team. We recommend keeping it fairly small, but as always, it's there's give and take, but we think about five people is probably a good max for a micro project. So everybody is has a voice, everybody is engaged. When you build the team, think about how you want to um, what kind of work's required, how you want to split up the tasks, uh, how much of a commitment you would like from people. If you don't know, you could leave that open, but if you want people working 10 hours a week, be upfront. So people only volunteer if they can meet that commitment. You specify the skills you're looking for and also the skill levels. So uh, you may have some experienced people, but maybe also have some less experienced people who have an opportunity then to grow and bring all their other experience to the team. So think about tools you want. And these days, think about location, like how much will you do online? And or are you hoping to meet in person? By setting, making that clear up front, when people volunteer, then you know that they can meet those commitments and your project will go smoothly. In the end, we want this to be your project. The way we came up with these projects was from a data thon run by Geo Women in Data. And the idea was that they ran a data thon where they had you decide what you want to do in the data thon, and you found your data, and they helped you through the data thon. And it was really interesting to see what people proposed and the work people did. And the feedback was really powerful that people found benefit in having to think through what they want to research and what their goal was and what the data was that they would use. And they appreciate the support from the geo women and data, but they also, it was a learning experience, a growth experience that um, helped them in other aspects of their day jobs. So remember, this is your project. It's a great opportunity but it is your project. So Data for Good will help and the project coordinators will definitely help, but it is your project. So we hope that there will be a high quality of work when you commit to a project. We hope you will learn and use your skills and teach skills because we all learn together then. And we hope you'll provide the feedback and present at a meetup. The project coordinators you'll be working with are an awesome resource because they'll help you find your volunteers. They'll help you build your team. They'll help you keep the project on track. They can, they will be updating and maintaining the micro project database, which is now an Excel spreadsheet, but still we're capturing the knowledge to put into this database when we build it next year. And they can answer questions and provide support from before the kickoff, at the kickoff. And at the end, make sure that what you have done is documented so we benefit from the work you've done. Everybody benefits from the work you have done. The support you get will be from the team you build, from your project coordinator, from the core team, so we'll be watching Slack, and which is our primary means of communication and supporting you with our knowledge and resources, and also from the Data for Good community. And I hope you post questions to Slack, and I hope people start using Slack more regularly because this is an amazing way to communicate and to share knowledge 
And with 600 plus people in the Slack channel and another 1,800 people who could join the chat Slack channel, that's a lot of collective knowledge to draw on. And if we get used to using this channel and sharing information via this channel, that would be an excellent thing. Timing, we mentioned one to four weeks. Keep it tight. And the one to four weeks is the work when you do the project. There will be a bit of lead time as the initiator when you pitch the project, we'll review it, we'll get back to you and then post for volunteers so you can assemble the team. So this lead time may be just a few days, but probably is going to be a few weeks. And as such, we would recommend that if since we're pitching this in November, it could be that you plan, your, you pitch your project and you get the volunteers before Christmas. And then either it's a small project you can still finish before Christmas, or maybe you find volunteers who would love to work over Christmas because for them, that would be the perfect time. Or you may want to kick off your project after Christmas. So just keep that in mind. The last time we started a cohort, it was just before summer and we found that we hadn't taken summer vacation into account and that was a problem for several projects that uh, people weren't as available as they would normally be during the year so do consider the timing so you can set up everybody for success so some of a couple of the projects that were done earlier this year was a nice project about pet adoption people were looking at what's happening with pet adoption and how COVID affected that. And we had a nice project about air quality analysis where um, we had some good visualizations and there's actually a Twitter feed you can subscribe to that every half hour, I think they update with a picture of what air quality is like in Calgary. So you can see how your neighborhood is faring every half hour. Um, there's a few projects that started in the summer and had the problems with summer vacation. So if they get restarted, you could uh, volunteer to support affordable housing, where they're making an in interactive map of affordable housing. Or um, another project wanted to look into school analysis, examine uh, the schools in Calgary. A few other projects that have happened in other cities are things like real-time bus tracking. And this is a picture of Calgary and where all the buses are at various times and whether they're on time or late or early, or I think gray is unknown status. There's a project in Chicago about E. coli levels in Chicago beaches. Like, the scope of finding public information and making it digestible for people to use to make decisions is huge. So think about uh, making, finding an open data set and how you can expose the data in there to make it interesting and accessible. Machine learning is, would be really interesting. If you have the skill set, we'd be love to see what you can do with that data visualization. There are so many things you can do. And what we do recommend is think agile or increments. So unless you have something very small and specific, you may want to think of a few steps in, a, in the project and then pitch the first step of. And once that's done, you can build on that for future steps. Yeah, just just referring back to the to the open data. So, I mean, the city of Calgary has an amazing open data portal uh, with literally hundreds, if not thousands, of data sets that are that are available. So, it's um, data.calgary.ca is is the city of Calgary. Alberta Alberta has has uh, open data. The government of Canada as well. So, uh, lots of open data there. You know, there's other data sets. There's um, uh, stats can you know so the new the new census um, uh, the new census is coming out in a variety of different subject areas so that's great source of 
uh, data is the census data, CRA has data. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind mm -hmm. of endless, right? So just kind of find your passion, find your uh, find what your what really excites you, and yeah, uh, pitch a project. Exactly. There's, a, there's a, been a couple other um, uh, questions, Corinne, about mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, the Slack channel. We're we're trying to get the link for you guys to join the Slack channel. Um, if if it's if we can't find that and it doesn't work appropriately, uh, you can always uh, ping us, um, <coughs> ping us, and then we can kind of invite you into that Slack channel as well. So um, you can do that, and then um, how to express how to express interest in in working on a project. So uh, this evening, you know, you might it's be in a room or whatever where you you can. Uh, you know, uh, work with the people in that same uh, uh, topic area and submit it. Um, we also have uh, so-called expression of interest, which uh, um, the uh, the link was here to this uh, this expression of interest. And on that expression of interest form, uh, you can um, it asks a whole bunch of questions about your background, which is great. Uh, to provide that to us so we can uh, slot you in. But there is a spot to say that you want to work on you know projects. Uh, and in the comments section, you can put you can put a specific uh, specific project uh, uh, name as well. So you can say you're interested in project based work. And then down here, you can say what project and what skills. If when you're if when it's a specific project, you can use this more generally, but this is our expression of interest form. And just if you select that you're interested in uh, project based work. And then just put in the comments here, the micro project you heard about and why you'd like to apply. That'd be great. Yeah. And also. Then so yeah, and then so the kind of the process is after, after this evening, there'll be a whole bunch of projects that will be proposed. Uh, we will, you know, uh, sort through them and, and kind of select that, you know, three to five projects to um, uh, to launch. Then we'll, and, and some teams will be fully formed. Other teams will need uh, volunteers. So we will uh, advertise that need um, on Slack, uh, through Twitter, uh, as well as uh, through uh, uh, notifications um, of, of uh, uh, folks that have been, you know, uh, through this, uh, this signed up for this particular meetup as well. Okay. We just wanted to show the names of the project coordinators who have volunteered to help be the liaison and support people that want to run these micro projects. So this is a list of names of people that you could end up working with when you pitch your project. We just want to give a shout out to them and thank them for volunteering and taking the training on how to be a project coordinator. And remember, this is our first year, so there may be learnings, but we certainly appreciate any feedback of what would make your life easier or what it make your life easy as you run these projects because we're looking forward to these projects being a great way to collaborate and to learn while doing data for good in calgary yeah and so um are, is that are you is that it correct yeah, that's it. I think okay. now we can, unless there's more questions, we can head to the brainstorming. Okay. Yeah, so I just, uh, there is a question about the process around uh, uh, pitching your projects. So um, we'll provide an opportunity right now if you if you want to do a little pitch, uh, you know, five minutes max kind of thing to kind of pitch your project. Uh, if you have a project idea, then uh, um, you don't have to pitch it verbally, uh, but we want you to put that I, the name of that project, that project idea into the chat. Uh, and then Ross uh, will create a breakout room 
Uh, so then after the, any pitches we have, we will then, uh, Ross will open up, we'll have a, a couple of the general breakout rooms, and then we'll have a list of all the ones that uh, ideas have, have been created. Uh, and then you, you, you will be able to move between, uh, between the breakout rooms, okay? So that, that's how the process will, will work. So if you have an idea right now, you can put it in the chat and Ross will create a breakout room. Uh, but I know there's at least uh, one person, uh, Derek, I think you want to uh, kind of pitch uh, your project idea. So um, five minutes max, away you go. <laughs> I'm up, all what's right. It, yeah, what's it about? All right, well, um, my name is Derek and I'm one of the founders of a company called Stagehand. We're a Calgary-based technology startup. Uh, and we, we've built a platform that's specifically focused on arts and culture. Um, we, uh, the easiest way to sort of conceptualize what it is that we do is to think of it, it's, it's sort of like Airbnb, but for the arts. Uh, so instead of uh, hosts and guests, we have venues and artists. It's been used mostly for music. Uh, we have many different venues. Um, a venue like Gravity Cafe, for example, in Inglewood has hosted over 800 performances with local artists. Uh, but one of the more interesting things that we did what, before the pandemic was with the Calgary Airport. Uh, the airport wanted to start a live music program, but of course, uh, they, they didn't have any experience working with, uh, with local artists. We helped them find a cohort of artists. And ultimately, they ended up hosting over 1,800 performances in the first year, which is more than cities like uh, uh, Nashville or, or Austin. Um, right now, we're working on a project with the city of Calgary, which is all about revitalization of the downtown core. Uh, so we're bringing artists into unconventional spaces like lobbies, commercial lobbies, plus 15s, libraries, uh, that sort of thing. So what makes us a social impact organization? Well, I guess uh, from one standpoint, uh, we were one of the first investments from Innovate Calgary's uh, UCED Social Impact Fund. Uh, so really we're about serving the 98% of artists who are not yet commercially successful. So, you know, we're not about Paul Brandt or, or uh, uh, Brett Kissel or artists that are already uh, work, you know, making it financially. We're about ser serving the artists that are really struggling to, uh, to find opportunities to perform and to develop their skills. So the problem that we've got is right now we've got, uh, we're, we're, we've booked, the platform's been used to book over 10,000 events. Uh, we've currently got 2,200 artists signed up on the platform. So that's, that's a bigger data set then, well, it's the biggest data set of artists in the province of Alberta, at least musicians, so bigger than the National Music Center or Alberta Music. Um, and that's because these artists use it as a platform for, for business. So the challenge can be when you're opening a new program, we will often get inundated by artists that are interested in being part of that program. So uh, with this Downtown Vibe project that we're doing right now, we probably had over a hundred artists uh, that have applied to be part of that. Right now, we don't, we've always resisted, uh, people will say, oh, why don't you have a rating system for artists? We've always resisted that because we believe that the arts is something that's, that's somewhat subjective uh, and you might not like my music, but that doesn't make my music as bad. Uh, so we've resisted the idea of putting ratings on artists like you know, Google or, or whoever might rate. Uh, okay, so Derek, Derek, you have to hustle it up a bit, get to, kind of get to the point, and then what's, okay. the name, what's the name of your project? And you can describe it more in your breakout room. Sure, I, I can't remember what I called the artist, but it's essentially a profile rating, sorry, it's a profile scoring system. So uh, what we've, so when artists come onto the platform, they create a profile that includes a bunch of information like their social media, uh, uh, they'll have videos, uh, if they've got music on Spotify and Apple and that sort of thing. We also track where they have performed and how often they perform. So all of that information is included on their profile. So we have a huge data set that we could use to essentially start to score a profile. I don't know if they still do it, but LinkedIn at one point, there was sort of a scoring that you did as you filled out your profile and then you had an 87 or, or whatever. But that would allow us as we get these uh, artist intakes to start to effectively sort 
artists by merit because right now we sort based on things like uh, is when when did the artist apply or alphabetically? So people start to game the system and it's zero, zero, one artist X, Y, Z, and then people sort to the top of the list. So we're looking for an algorithm that would effectively help us to more effectively score those profiles so we can get a more uh, accurate assessment of, uh, oh, you know, how, how active is this artist uh, in the local community? How successful are they? How hard are they working at, at their art? And so therefore, if I'm somebody that's looking to hire that particular artist, you know, where, where do they sit sort of compared to, to other artists? In okay, uh, that's, that's great, uh, Derek. That It's called Artist Profile Scoring Algorithm. So if you, right. if you see that title, then that's the project that Derek started to describe. We have a Couple other folks that want to do a quick uh, less than five minute pitch. Uh, so uh, Eugene, you're next. Sure. Sorry, I, actually Jorge can probably get gets right here. I I'm just putting something away and I'll be right there. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yes. Hi. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the idea I have, actually this project that has already, uh, has some work already done. Uh, and the idea is about uh, using open data from uh, the portal that Jeff actually uh, mentioned earlier uh, to provide um, information about different issues at the community level. And when I mean community, I mean the neighborhood level. So the city of Calgary actually publishes a bunch of data um, uh, that is, uh, you know, disaggregated to know exactly what's happening in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And I think there's like value to tell stories from that data. Um, and the idea behind all this is that, um, you know, when we're, when we receive information every day from the news or, or social media, most of the time we get information from like international news or national news. And I think that uh, there's very little information on what's happening in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Uh, and I think this data can tell those stories, right? And, and the idea behind that is that once we know what, what's happening in our communities, we can actually encourage and empower citizens to take actions on those issues, okay? So um, I'm, I actually have like a, like a small demo that I can show you guys in the, in the breakout rooms, but uh, generally speaking, the idea is about empowering uh, citizen participation by providing uh, data at the community level. Uh, okay. The name of the project is called a YYC Data Post. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to speaking to okay. you guys in the in the breakout rooms. All right. So did you put that in the chat so that Ross can can get it? I I'll put it right now. Okay, that's good. Uh, Eugene, are you ready? Yeah, I'm mean, as ready as I'll ever be. Okay. Okay. You gotta oh, go I'm quick. so sorry. You gotta go um, okay, I'm gonna turn on this video because everyone can't see me and I'm sure I'm creeping everybody else out <laughs> by just even trying. Um, hi, my name is Eugene. I, this pro the name of the project is called Bike360 or probably gonna be Paths360. But what it is, is I have scooted and walked over 500 kilometers um, in, and I'll say it's in Edmonton, but I, I, I promise you this is valuable to Calgary as well and really all the uh, rest of Canada. And I've been doing so with a 360 camera with the idea of covering bike paths that aren't generally covered by Google. So I take the footage, I upload it to Google. And so far since September, um, there have been over 1 million views on Google Street View of that project. So people have gotten to look at the bike paths. Um, and it's been really fascinating to see the uptake. It just tells me that there is great interest in citizens, regardless of what city they're from, um, in checking out the bike paths or the walk paths or trails around areas that they live in or want to move to. Um, the, the ask here is, I think that with that sort of interest, uh, I, I, I'd like for this project to continue, but possibly across Canada, including Calgary, obviously. And the ask is really, I think that if it's possible, and this is where I'm asking for help, to try and um, grab the video data that I currently have that I want to put on open data 
step one, being able to de-identify people by taking away faces, blurring faces and license plates. Step two, being able to extract the GPS data that's on it and maybe make some edits to it. And then step three, and um, to be able to alter some of the footage to allow people to put their copyright information on it. That way it can be a project that across Canada, people can actually contribute towards their own communities. And then we can see instead of just Eugene as one person doing you know, parts of Edmonton, it could be um, maybe in Alberta, it'd be like 5 million views a month or something like that of what community people have put together. So that's the name of the project is Bike360. The sort of help I'm looking for, I, I think I just laid out. Thanks, Joe. Okay, great. So Bike Bike 360, that'll be the, the project title for, uh, for Eugene's project. So- Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, if there's anybody else who wants to pitch, let's speak up now. Uh, if not, then we will, uh, Ross will open up the, uh, the breakout rooms. Um, we will go um, for about 15 minutes, I guess, just, just to kind of get, um, take that first pass through. And you can, again, you can hop into a general room and come up with a new idea. Uh, hop into one of the existing ideas. You can move around between rooms as well. Uh, but if you're getting serious, don't forget to uh, uh, have a, a project initiator uh, submit the the idea on the project form uh, with the team if it's if 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 you're uh, if you're together tonight. Okay. Uh, any other any questions before we split up? All right, Ross, you can uh, open up those. You'll have a list of rooms. You should be able to choose. Uh, if you exit your room, you'll come back to the main room, then you can choose a new room, right? Ross, is that how it works? Yep, that's how it works. Okay, cool.